Oh, guys, listen. Where did Bitcoin come from? Well, we're going to look at a few facts here. And one of the details I'm going to look at is not a fact. And I'll tell you when I get to that detail, that's not a fact. Uh, but I think it's kind of pertinent, so I put it in there anyway. And uh, <clears throat> But most of these things we're going to look at are facts that actually happened. And whenever I come to something that's not an actual fact, I'll, I'll tell you, okay? So, but I'm going to show you the things that are facts, and and and, uh, and we're going to get right into it. So we need to open up the charts because this is going to be a very interesting show. First thing we want to take a look at is <clears throat> is the Nazis, you know, during World War II. They were uh, deeply involved in the occult. First, maybe I better go over here and show you uh, the different societies that they had. Uh, let me see uh, here in. Uh, what I put in the, the search engine on Google was World War II German occult societies. And they did. They had a number of societies that were working in Germany at the time during World War II. And these were very, very deeply involved in the occult. One was called the Thule Society, right here. The Thule Society. Originally, uh, this was a, an, a Germanist occultist group founded in Munich right after World War I. Uh, this society was uh, notably chiefly the organization that sponsored uh, uh, the German Workers' Party and so on. So they had that society right there. Now they had more. Okay, let's, uh, they had more societies in Germany. And all these were deeply involved in the occult. The next society we want to look at is the, uh, I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it, but it's the, I call it Anunnabi or Anaherbi, uh, something like that. But it was a, another one of these societies that operated in Nazi Germany between 1935 and 1945. Uh, this, I guess, was behind the SS, this particular society, uh, the Anunnabi uh, or Anunnabi Society. And then they had a third one, uh, a third society here. Uh, that was called the Vril, the Vril Society, it was called. And that was a third uh, German secret society that was involved in all of this. So, so they had three. And these societies were all very, very deeply involved in the occult. Now, there's stories. Now, this is where we're going to get into a little bit of the unver unverifiable stuff. Is there stories that these societies had made contact using oh, oh, the occult and uh, using psychics and stuff. There, there's stories uh, about this, but uh, I'm not going to get into that too much. Now, that's not fact, you know. That's just, that's that's not the fact part. We're going to try to stick with facts on this. There's three, there three Nazi societies. Now, what happened toward the end of the war is, they had something called Operation Paperclip. Now, this is back to facts again. Operation Paperclip is real. You can look it up on the Internet here. Uh, it was a secret program of the Joint Intelligent Objective Agencies, largely carried out by special agents of the CIC with more than 1,600 German scientists and engineers and technicians, such as Warner von Braun and his V-2 rocket team. And there's a picture of all of these German scientists, or, or just that's not all of them. Because there's 1,600 and there's only about 50 men or maybe 75 men standing there. So, so that's just a very small number of them that were brought over during Operation Paperclip. Which was a very secret operation. It had to remain secret because uh, if the people of America knew that they were working with Nazis, it would have been big trouble. Let's just put it that way. Now, what were these Nazis up to in Germany toward the end, uh, toward the end of the war that the Americans, you know, were... were uh, wanting to bring them over to obtain these technologies. What were they up to? There was secret technologies invented by the Nazis. And some of these technologies included very possibly, very possibly, but this again realm is in the realm of not being verifiable, nuclear weapons. But they, what is verifiable is that the Nazis were well on their way to developing nuclear weapons. That's the official story. Uh, that's the official story everybody's, everybody's told. Uh, I'm not going to say whether that's true or not, but
But that's the official story. They made the first world's first mass-produced helicopters. There's a picture of one of them. They were making space planes, the Germans. Okay, they were making sophisticated jet fighters and bombers. They were making guided missile submarines. They were building super cannons. They were building stealth bombers. Guided point defense rockets. And there's one of their rockets. Portable aircraft, anti-aircraft rockets they were making. Giant mega tanks they were building. Guided missiles they were building. Spherical tanks they were building. And they were working on systems. Now, this is not verifiable, but possibly space-based laser systems. Now, this one's not verifiable either, the Nazis. This one's not verifiable either, dark side moon base, you know, a, a base on the moon. And this one is... Mm, I'm not going to say it's not verifiable, but it's 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 one that is a a lore, a, a legend of the bell, the Nazi bell. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so so we have these things that the Nazis were were actually doing, and this one is not verifiable either. But we do know that they had occult societies there at that particular time, and we do know that they were trying. Let's put it this way: trying to find the secrets that lay behind all of these mysterious objects. Now, there's some truth to the movie called Raiders of the Lost Dark, where Harrison Ford played in that movie, and he was trying to search for these things, uh, these ancient religious objects and relics and stuff. The Nazis were scouring the earth for these relics and trying to understand the secrets of, the, of, the, of so-called occult powers and stuff. And they were working very extensively in this with these three societies that they had. Now, uh, we have Operation Paperclip. And uh, all of these inventions that the Nazis had come rather quickly. Boom, boom, boom. Just like that. Uh, rockets. Boom, boom, boom. They had rockets. They were working heavily into trying to develop nuclear technologies. They had heavy water plants and stuff where they were trying to produce the components needed to make the nuclear bomb. And also... They developed. Uh, uh, they they were developing technologies that were far in advance of, of what other people had. That's why they wanted to bring these guys over. They wanted to find out how are these guys figuring all this stuff out so fast. We want some of this technology, and so they brought these sixteen hundred guys over in Project Paperclip. Now, how does this all apply to Bitcoin? Well, we're going to take a look at some theory again right here. Now, this is only theory theoretical that there was a majestic 12 organization that was put together and this organization was going back to the original of the of of these intelligence agencies it goes back to the origin of these intelligence agencies now this is all theoretical about the majestic 12 organization but they go on here to list the members of this alleged organization and the members are listed as Lloyd Berkner, Devlin Bronk. Okay, so we got Lloyd von Bruckner, Devlin Bronk, Vannemar Bush, James Forrestal, Gordon Gray. I guess they don't have a picture of him. Roscoe Hillencoder. Now, this is the one I want to point out right here, Roscoe H. Hillencoder. Jerome Clark Huntsicker. Donald H. Mensel, Robert S. Montague, Sidney Sowers, Nathan F. F. Twining, and he was an important one too, and Hoyt Vandenberg, Hoyt S. Vandenberg. This is a list of the alleged members of this alleged organization. Now, this organization, we have to take a look. Now, we're going to go back to facts again. Roscoe, Roscoe Hillencoder which was one of the alleged members of this organization, but the fact is that he did exist as the, the first director of the United States Central Intelligence Agency. And so, in other words, 
the CIA, the first director of the CIA, was an alleged member of, of a secret organization. That, uh, so, so that's all alleged. But what's real is that he really was the first director of the CIA. He's listed here as the first director of the CIA. First director of the CIA, President Truman persuaded reluct a reluctant Helen Coder then a rear admiral to become the director of the Central Intelligence Agency and run the Central Intelligence Group from September 1947 under the National Security Act of 1947. He was nominated and confirmed by the United States Senate as DCI now in charge of the newly established Central Intelligence Agency. So, so that's real information right there on Roscoe Hillencoder. Now, what was going on? These intelligence agencies... Uh, first, we're going to take a look here at the National Security Agency, which is one of these intelligence agencies. And this intelligence agency, I'm going to read to you what it's about. It's a national level intelligence agency of the United States Department of Defense. Under the authority of the Director of National Intelligence, the NSA is responsible for global monitoring, collection, and processing of information and data for foreign and domestic intelligence and counterintelligence purposes. So they're the data collection agency. Now, we all know that the CIA peeks into data too, you know, but these agencies, they, 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 they sort of work together. And, and the NSA is the agency that's in charge of data and, uh, and foreign and domestic intelligence and counterintelligence purposes. So the NSA, what are they exactly involved in? Well, let's take a look here. Secure hash algorithms. Okay. Do you know? Do you guys know what this is? Here's the first secure hash algorithm. SHA.0 and SHA.1. Now, I'm going to tell you. SHA-256 is the algorithm that Bitcoin is. You see where we're going with this? And we read here a little bit. SHA-1, 160-bit hash function, which resembles the early MD5 algorithm. This was designed by the National Security Agency. Okay? SHA-2, a family of two similar hash functions with different block sizes, known as SHA-256. Now, that's Bitcoin. SHA-256 is Bitcoin. And SHA-512. Says a differing word size. SHA-256 uses 32-bit words, where SHA-512 uses 64-bit words. They are also functionated versions of each standard known as SHA-224, SHA-384, and SHA-512, and SHA-512-256. These were also designed by the NSA. Okay? So now we know that the protocol that Bitcoin runs on, basically the tracks... If you got a train, a train has to have tracks. The tracks are designed by the NSA. Okay? And that doesn't prove that Bitcoin was designed by the NSA. It just proves that the tracks needs to run on. But if you're going to build a set of tracks, doesn't the train come to mind? What would the tracks be for if you don't have a train? Bitcoin's the train. Okay? So we got that far. Now, let's take a look here at Satoshi Nakamoto. Okay, He's supposed to be the inventor of Bitcoin. Everybody accredits him with being the inventor. Did he invent the tracks too? Well, obviously no. But he's supposed to have invented the train that runs on the tracks. But what do we read here? It says, Satoshi Nakamoto is a name used by an unknown person or people who developed Bitcoin and authored the Bitcoin white paper and created and deployed Bitcoin's original reference implementation. Ah, so we got the train here that runs on the tracks. We know who invented the tracks, but we don't know who invented the train. And they're saying it's Satachi Nakamoto. Now, there's been a number of men that's come forth and said, hey, I'm Satachi. And I think one of them, they went out and said, well, they didn't, he didn't say, I'm Satachi. They said, you're Satachi. But none of it's really panned out, of these guys who say they're Satachi, right? What it says here in Wikipedia is, is what I believe. It's a name used by an unknown person or people who developed Bitcoin. 
Now, where does the evidence point? Well, now we're going to get into some tricky stuff. Most of you guys know who Jim Rickards is. Jim Rickards is a financial analyst of the of a very high magnitude. He he's got a an intellectual brain that is like it's amazing. You know? And evidently here the CIA uh, he was asked to help them because of his financial knowledge. I think that he's a tremendously smart man. Says in 2009, now isn't that just coincidental that that's the year Bitcoin was created? Currency Wars author James Rickards was asked to help the Pentagon conduct a financial war game. Now this, all this I'm, I'm reading here, I personally believe it to be true. But they were asking him in to help them, help the Pentagon conduct a financial war game. The scenario he devised, in the scenario that he devised, China and Russia teamed up to hoard gold. Boy, doesn't that sound familiar to what's going on right now? And then they put forth a gold-backed currency based out of London. It ran the U.S. dollar off of the road in the war game. Okay, so it destroyed the U.S. dollar. And, of course, at the same time, they didn't state it here, but, of course, at the same time, it would have made China and Russia the richest countries on earth. Well, we know facts. Now, let's get back to facts. China and Russia have been hoarding all the gold in the world. <laughs> this is a fact. And we also know that the central banks have been trying to get some. They've been trying to get some. Are they actually trying to combat Russia and China's what Russia and China's way ahead of them? And these central banks that are trying to get gold right now, are they actually trying to combat what China and Russia's already done? Quite a big question there. Uh it says it ran the U.S. dollar off of the road. At the time, Richard Rickards said the war game participants from the Treasury, CIA, FBI laughed at him because there was no way that was going to happen. Since 2009, though, China and Russia have tripled their gold holdings. Rickards contends a currency war is on the way. Well, guess what? We're already in a trade war. How much of a stretch of the imagination is it to believe that a currency war could be coming very soon? The dollar continues to fall against global currencies as the Trump administration has signaled that they welcome a weaken, weaker U.S. dollar. China will likely fight back, devaluing their currency to make exports cheaper to foreign buyers. In this environment, Eurozone countries may respond in kind. Currency wars can last 5 to 15 years at a time. Uh, Rickard's comment is to for the u.s to buy gold well we see the central banks buying gold now the chinese and russians are preparing for an international monetary collapse now this was written a while ago but i believe this is true they have intelligence agencies just like we do in russia and in china and if we all are waiting for the collapse they're waiting for it too and they're thinking about how they can take advantage of this collapse now with that in mind Think now back about Bitcoin. Think about the West, way back in 2009, doing these war games. And Jim Rickards was involved. Okay? And they already ran the scenarios through their computer, and they knew that the Russians and Chinese are storing gold, and they know that the Russians and Chinese are going to use gold as a weapon. Weaponized gold. You got that part? Now... Our intelligence agencies would say to themselves, well, what are we going to do? They've already got a kickstart way ahead of us on, on, on getting all the gold. Now, what I'm going to tell you right now is theoretical. It's, it's all, we're going to delve now into, the, into just speculation. So this is not fact anymore. We've went through a, a number of facts. Now we're going to talk about something that's not factual. Not factual. But what if... Our intelligence agency said, hey, you know what? We need to do something. We've ran these war scenarios now. 
We know that there's no way to stop the Russians and Chinese from accumulating all this gold and using it as a weapon of financial destruction against the West when we have undergo our collapse. And they probably all said, yeah, they'll, they'll have us as slaves. They'll, they'll create a gold-backed currency and our currency will go to dust and they will own everything. And they'll do it without dropping a bomb. They'll just do it by financial means. And the West probably said to themselves, hey, you know, what are we going to do? And they probably said, well, you know, we will have to create something that's like gold and silver. But better. And maybe the discussion went around, well, how are we going to do that? And maybe one of them said, well, let's make electronic gold and silver. That's better than the real thing. And these discussions went around, probably with, with different men putting forth their little ideas about what they thought they should do. And, of course, they had computer scientists at their av availability. And uh, the rest is probably just history. But let me point out that I think it's entirely possible and very probable when they got their first creation made, and they were like in the laboratory, and it's like having Frankenstein on the table, you know. And they finally pull the handle down, and, and he comes to life, and they say, He's alive! He's alive! I think that's the way with Bitcoin. I think that they started it up, and they worked with it, and it, it's alive! It lives! But it was only, they were only planning probably on testing it. As a weapon a weapon system to fight the Chinese and the Russians. Digital gold, digital silver, Bitcoin, Litecoin. Probably just a test to see if this could substitute for real gold and silver and combat the Russians and the Chinese and what they're trying to do. This is a theory. Now this is not fact, this is only a theory. So they created the thing possibly. It's like Frankenstein. It came alive. And then they decide to try it to see how it would function. But the problem with that is that they released it to the public. And ever since then till now, this is like releasing a virus into a system. This is like somebody when they catch the flu and the little viruses start out small. They get one little tiny virus, one little tiny speck a virus in their body and it starts out as a speck and it grows bigger and bigger until it makes the person really really ill because then they got millions and billions of these viruses inside them because it grows well back in 2009 they released this thing and it started like a tiny speck like a virus implanted in the system and it's been growing exponentially ever since the ultimate conclusion of this is that this will take over. Now, if this was a person that caught a virus, right now we're in the stage where they're starting to get a sore throat. And they're starting to get noticeable symptoms. But they're not real sick yet. They're still at work. You ever, you ever caught a flu and, and for the first week that flu's incubating in you and you're not sick at all. That's because there's only tiny amounts of the virus, but they're growing inside you. Then when you finally feel the sore throat coming on, you're finally getting a little bit of a headache, you're still at work and you, you pass it off. It's, you're still able to function and you don't have a fever yet and you're, yet you, feel, you don't feel quite right. You go over to the boss and you say, you know what, I think I'm going to quit early tonight because I just, I just, I got a headache and, and my throat's a little bit sore, but I still feel okay, but I'm just going to take it easy the rest of the night. Boss says, okay, go home and take it easy. Well, at that point right there, the system is, your system is still functioning. And that's where we are right now with Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies. It's spreading like a virus exponentially, but the patient hasn't fell ill yet. The regular financial system is still functioning and operating. But the ultimate conclusion of this is that the big fever is coming. And it's not that far away now at this point. It's, it's almost like 
from 2009 till now was a week when the virus was incubating. It was like a whole week where the guy didn't feel nothing. He felt fine. But those viruses were doubling and tripling and quadrupling within his system. It's called incubation period. Well, Bitcoin went through its incubation period all those 10 years from 2009 up until the present. But now it's replicated itself through the system. And every day it's growing. The network's growing. They're, they're doing more and more. Now, I think that they possibly released this thing into the system just wanting to do a test of it. And it got loose. Once it's loose into the system, the source code's out there. Then at that point, the horse is out of the barn. There's no putting him back in. And the ultimate conclusion, the ending of all of this is, it's going to take over the entire monetary system. It's going to be the end of fiat currencies. That's the ultimate conclusion. And we're about, we're probably in this thing, we're probably about three quarters of the way to that happening. We just don't realize it. And we're just like the guy who's caught the virus and now he's just starting to feel sick. But the next day, he's going to really be sick. Now, that week that went by, while well, that virus was incubating, he didn't feel practically nothing. That's what we're like. The, the years of 2009 till now didn't practically feel nothing. Just starting to feel the effects of Bitcoin. Bitcoin surged up to 700 or $800 billion market cap. Now it's settled back down to $130 billion. Do not be fooled. It's twice as big right now as it was when it was at twenty. Uh, when it was at twenty thousand dollars right now even though the price is down that actual bitcoin everywhere is spreading through the world is twice as big as it was it's growing exponentially there's a limited amount of period of time yet before this monster that they created and i'm going to call it that i i i can't say for sure but i do know there was a creator but whoever created it, i'll just say whoever created it this monster that they've created. And why I call it a monster is because of the disruption that it's going to cause to the system. Just like the flu would cause a disruption to the man's... He's not going to be able to go to work the next day. He's going to be laying in bed there. Well, what do you think is going to happen to the financial system when this transition takes place and all of the world's value starts to transit from fiat into, into cryptography? in the cryptographic it's going to cause tremendous disruption it's going to make the world sick so what else was there here i had here to show you guys i think i've went over pretty much all the points in this topic thank you guys for listening if you guys don't secure your bitcoins at a certain point if i'm right about this then if you try to buy in after this transition happens, you're not going to be able to get very much. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Because the ultimate and the ultimate conclusion of all of this, one Satoshi might be worth the equivalent of what a buck is worth now. Quite seriously. If 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 I'm right about what's going on with all of this. You know? And, I mean, if you've got $100,000 in the bank right now, that means you'd be able to buy 100,000 Satoshis, which is the smallest fraction of a Bitcoin. Well, there's 99 million in one Bitcoin. That means that you would get one-tenth of 1% 1 for $100,000. One-tenth of 1%. You know? Which is not very much. It's like, how would you write that in Bitcoin? That would be like uh, point zero zero. Is it point zero zero one? I think that's what it is. Or see the point zero zero one or point zero 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 one for a hundred thousand dollars. If you wait until all of this is over, you know. Or right now, you can go in and take a hundred bucks, you know, and you can get yourself like two whole percentages, you know. Which, which is like, if this transition actually happens, that just that two percent would would be like astronomical because that would be two 
million, that would be the equivalent of two million dollars right now. So a lot of people say, hey, you know what? The Bitcoin train has left. You've all missed out. It's over now and everything. Little do they know what I think is coming. Thank you guys for listening. Like and subscribe, and we'll catch you in the next show. Bye-bye, guys.